man travels the world over in search of what he needs and returns home to find it. George Augustus Moore, who lived from 1852 to 1933. One evening fair, as I went on my rambles, along by La Carra's rocky shore, with rod and lure, I looked way out yonder. On Castle Island, where rests old George Moore, and gazing out, my thoughts I did ponder of times gone by and splendid Moor Hall. Oh, we're here uh, at Moor Hall, which is just outside Carnacon and beside Lake La Cara. And uh, this house uh, was built in uh, 1795. But to get a more in-depth history about who the Moors and the people that were involved, well, uh, my good friend here, Charlie, might explain a bit of the background of who the Moors were. Well, originally the, 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 the Moors came from England to Strayed, Ashbrook. Strayed, and that's where John Moore, uh, uh, George Moore's father, settled. But just around or after the time of the Penal Laws, George decided to move to Spain. Yeah. And he set up a, a business there. He became a wine and a brandy merchant, a fairly lucrative. Mark, mm -hmm. because he he was dealing with, uh, of course, the well-to-do, and he was married to a D. Kelly as well that's too, right. and she had a mm -hmm. quite a, a wealth as well, as she far did, as I yeah. know. Uh, th she was a Galway woman. And she was Catholic actually, and I think that was right. part of the reason why he became Catholic. He was exactly. originally Protestant. Yeah, 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 they were they were of the Protestant stock. Yes, of the, uh, we sh we'll say the the, the 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 Church of England at the time, but. Um, as, anyway, it was Alicante, or Alicante, was, yeah, yeah. was the was the region or the, the place that he worked out of. Now I don't I don't think they had um, vineyards or the like, but seemingly they were getting supplied with. Uh, yeah, they had some ships anyway, as far as they I had know. ships and they covered the Mediterranean and they brought in a lot of um, a lot of wine and, and brandy into the port of Galway. Right, and that's where the his connection wife probably connection was yeah. There. Now, he did return, as you say, in, in, in um, 1792, well, yeah. he, 1792, he, he purchased the land here. Yeah. Now, there was something in the region of the first purchase, I think, there was something like 4,000 acres. But that, over the years, that expanded into, I think, oh, around 12,000, 12, 12, I yeah. think, was about, about the size, right. give or take a few acres. Yeah, say. but. Right. Um, he he he, um, he set up there, and um, they started to build this 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 house. Seventeen ninety five, I think, or thereabouts. The seventeen ninety five. I don't know, is it on it? But it's that'd be about the date of the house, and he settled. They settled in here. There was a forge, and there was a coopery, and there was there was a huge lavender, you know. Yeah. For for, for uh, there was um, of course the walled orchard as well. Yeah, there yeah. was uh, a few coach houses as well. There was uh, massive storage buildings, so I. They would be employing a lot of people so in the local a, area. A, yeah, a good few of the locals employed here, and uh, he he had I think five in family. Two died in Spain. All they were all born in Spain. Right. John, who became the uh, president of of Connacht. Uh, of Connacht, he uh, he was the elder of the family. He was educated in uh, 
in well, Belgium. In, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. what I wonder was there, when, when they came into Castlebar, uh, the, the races of Castlebar, as it was called at the time, uh, when General Humbert and uh, the French came into Castlebar and they took over Castlebar and they moved on further up, he was appointed governor of Connacht. But I wonder the fact that uh, Humbert and the French, and he would have spoken French. He spoke Spanish, French. He was, as they say, he was educated in, yeah. in Belgium. Liege was the university in the university w there. Would Himself that and his brother uh, George, both right. of them were. Uh, and educated. would that have anything to do with him being appointed? I wonder. Well, there's no record of him being a card carrying uh, United Irishman. No. <laughs> but he had sympathies. Now, we have to remember that he had spent a good while in, in Paris himself and his brother. From there, they went back to London. He yes. practised law for a while there. He was a huge socialite. He loved to get out and right. out around the people and socialise and dance and drink. And he was that type of a guy. So he came to Dublin to finish his, his, his law studies. But I don't know how far he progressed in his law studies. I know George, the younger son, or the younger brother... He, he did become uh, a lawyer, all right. But uh, when hearing of the landing of the French in, uh, at uh, Kilcommon, mm. he left Dublin fairly rapidly. The news the travelled spread, fairly yeah. fast. I'm sure Dublin Castle got the word. So he headed down here. Now, I don't think he even stopped here. Yeah. I don't even think he stopped to see his mother and father. He headed straight for Castle Barrow. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, there was huge celebrations in Castlebar. Yeah. There was, there was victory was celebrations. Big, a big event. The French were there, and, of course, he was introduced to... Uh, he was introduced to Humbert, and, and they spoke French, and, of course, he was one of the aristocracy as far as Humbert was concerned. He could speak French. He was yeah. a well-to-do type of a guy. He impressed Humbert, and that's how he got, got appointed. Mom. Yeah. I don't think he had... I mean to say, it wouldn't have been in his interest to be involved in uh, uprisings. The sort of guillotine type of uh, politics, the whole, the order yeah. of the day. You know? It didn't last long, though. It only lasted a few weeks. It didn't last long. And he was, he was, he was, uh, he was arrested and he was tried. arrested. He and the funny thing about him, he could have got away. He was almost away. Uh, the story goes that he was on his horse. His horse was, his horse was prepared for him, like he was practically mounted on his horse, and whatever him, the uh, red coats, got him. And the human just zoomed in on him. <laughs> they put him into the jail. They held him in the jail in Castlebar. Yeah. He was held there for a while, but he really developed uh, ill health there. Yeah. His father now being who he was, he was a huge influential person. Mm -hmm. A member of, the, of, of that class. And he tried his damnedest. He got the best lawyers in the country. But anyway, eventually, Dennis Brown of Westport House, or well, Dennis was the high sheriff of the time, and Dennis, under no circumstances, wanted him freed. Mm -hmm. He wanted him home in Castlebar. As an example to all the rest. Eventually, they've spent a lot of money. The courts. It was the courts. So they, they, they decided to transport him mm -hmm. to Van Diemen's land. So he was in a, he was in a bad way. They, in fact, they, they, he was taken. He must be the only prisoner that was ever taken to passage in a carriage. Mm -hmm. But he was taken in chains, and he was brought as f into along by the the Shore River uh, that direction, the whole way down the country, escorted by cavalry, and uh, he took ill. And there was the the uh, the Royal Oak Tavern, just outside Waterford, on your way to New Geneva Barracks. He died in the Royal Oak Tavern. And was buried somewhere there too. He was there? buried in Ballygunner Cemetery. Oh, yeah. But uh, he, his body then was reinterred from there in 19, the early 60s. Yeah. Uh, and it was interred on the green in, the, in Castle Bear, on the, the Mallet. And uh, that was a big occasion because uh, it was a full military service. Um, De Valera, all the powers that be were down at the time and there was foreign ambassadors as well there invited oh, to that. Yeah, yeah. So it was quite a big occasion and for anybody that wants to look there, it's there on the Mile and Castle Bar there. 
Then we're moving to kind of the next uh, George Moore. Uh, we're moving into the 1800s and uh, we're coming up, we'll say, up towards the famine period, towards 1845. Now, uh, George Moore and his brother Augustus were incessant horsemen. That's right. Uh, to the degree that in 1845, uh, Augustus died as a result of an accident off a horse. That's right, an entry. Uh, an entry. Uh, and. Uh, it caused George to be, uh, he was very upset about the whole thing and he kind of went into a depression. That's right, yeah. He came to the house here, but uh, I suppose he began to realise, you know, the famine was kind of in the throes at the time, 1845, 1846. It was getting worse, 1840. So he decided, uh, he had a mortgage in the house here, you know. They weren't quite as well off then no, as they had no, been they before. No. Things were just on a downer. No, His tenants couldn't pay rent. And in fairness to him, he wasn't inclined to evict. But he had a horse called Corana. And that horse uh, won the Derby in England in 1846. And with it came a massive amount of money at the time, £17,000 and all. Right. And he ordered shiploads of grain from America to be brought in, which are brought into West yeah, uh, John George Brown, uh, of course, was involved in that shipment as well. Yes. There was another, there was three landlords as, as far as... The Marcus of Sligo, yeah, yeah Westport House. Uh, they, they got it in, well, they got in definitely one load came in at the quay, yeah. more than likely two. Um, it was a big undertaking at the time. And I believe that at the time as well, too, anybody that didn't have a cow on his estate, there was a cow bought for That's them. That's right, he bought it. He, bought, he, he was supposedly have to bought a cow for... A, that was a, a, a substantial was, act. It was, it was, it, it was a great, it was a great gesture to the... To his tenants, like. yeah, but he was uh, a very good landlord. Was yeah. Um, he was also uh, represented the area. He was. The an, he was the MP yeah. for the for the area here, and uh, he lived in London, uh, away from the house, and he uh, he had to come back maybe a few times to try and resolve some situation. Now, it's interesting though, going back to the story about Karana, like you know, because there's a place here called Drimanishilla Hill, which is not far; it's on the estate. And the horse was a fine, strong horse, but he wouldn't have been considered the best runner in the world. But they kept training the horse up against this hill at the end of his training each time they trained him. And the idea being that, you know, while he may be a little bit behind in the race, the other horses would be getting tired because I think it was a two or three mile race. It's a fairly long race. Uh, and it's exactly what happened in the course of the race. He was behind. The other horses seemed, it seemed almost like that he was out of it. But at the, la the latter stretch, he had that extra gist to go ahead. Somewhere in that wild and lovely stretch of wooded country that clothes the shores of Loch Corrin, County Mayo, and within sight of the now roofless walls of Moor Hall, stands a little hill called Remina Shinna. It was this remote little hill which decided the result of the Chester Cup of 1846, and with it the fate of thousands of Mayo starving people. Ireland lay in the throes of the great potato famine of 46 and 47. All over the country conditions were appalling, but nowhere were they worse than on the estates of George Henry Moore of Moore Hall in South Mayo. And I think there was a huge amount of money bet on him as well too. This is why the takings were so high. Uh, seventeen thousand pounds is like several million oh, today. Be, but as I said before, they, that was the aristocracy at the time. They could afford. They they were the people that brought blood sport to the level. Yeah. It, it, it even is today. But that's where it came from. Oh, they correct, were the yeah. foundations of you know the, uh, of horse racing. Well, such. of course, a horse that time was like a Rolls Royce today. Well, a horse was, was, <laughs> I mean, it was it was the time that was in it because uh, uh, that was the mode of transport. A horse was huge. It was a like sport. It. There was a, a, a huge amount of things attached to having a horse. Yeah. There were also work horses. You know, that, there was no tractors, so they did plough and they did all kinds of things. So they were also considered to be um, kind of um, favourable towards the arts or musicians. This house was always a welcoming guest for poets or writers or various other people like that that came along here. Uh, the likes of W. B. Yeats was a regular visitor here. Oscar Wilde was friendly with Oscar some of the later. Oscar Wilde was was a, was uh, a friend of um, George, George Augustus. Augustus. Yeah, yeah. And like it was during that time the, the Celtic type, the revival that he, yeah. uh, 
Well, we're on to the next family, really, at that stage, because we were gone. he was born in 1852. He was born in he'd be the next, that'd be yeah. the next generation. That'd be the, that, that's the last generation that lived Correct. here. That's right, yeah. So, like, and, and he, um, like George Augustus, the, the author, and he was a playwright, he was everything. He was involved in, in the setting up of the Abbey Theatre, too. He was, yeah. He was a great Lady friend Gregory. of Lady Gregory and all of those, yeah. Correct, you know, yeah. But so he, he had something, he, he, he was he was talented. Yeah. Um, well, it's astounding to think like that through these steps and into there when some of the finest writers in Europe, you can say, yeah. at different times, and musicians and all kinds. Oh, yeah, even, so, uh, even O'Donovan Rossa. That's yeah. right. He visited here too. Yeah, the house itself uh, has a lot of a, had a lot of fine attractions. In that, uh, if you look at the house in the way it's designed, mm. you have on the lower level. Well, of course, there's the servants' quarters that are underneath, as under all of these houses. And uh, then you have an area even up there in the centre place. If somebody wants to uh, come out and yeah. give commands, yeah. uh, they stood the out balcony, there yeah. on the balcony there. Uh, as far as I know, to the. Uh, the library was uh, just adjacent to that there. But a, well, a lot of these buildings, the windows at the bottom were kept at a higher level, reduced as they went up. As they went up. And because these buildings were very high, they, they never had a singular air roof. It was always a series of hip roofs, right, right, right. which could be problematic at the time because you needed a lot of lead valleys. And, it was pro uh, problematic because it leaked quite a lot. Yeah, so yeah that was always a problem they, with they those. They got it redone, isn't it funny, in, in, in George Augustus' time. Right. And uh, they redone the roof. Oh, and, yeah, and well. They brought it down. they brought it down lower. It was a higher roof. Yes. And uh, it, it didn't last long, I suppose. Um, it was... Um, well, the wind uh, levels and everything around here, too, can be, you know, this is a beautiful, fine day here, but the west of Ireland, you know, ha has some characteristics that are not always favourable to no. tourist buildings. And gazing out, my thoughts I did ponder Of times gone now, uh, George Moore, George Augustus Moore, the writer now, uh, he was born in 1852 and he died in 1933 and he's buried out on Lockhart Island. He spent quite a bit of time now in England and he also spent a lot of time in France. And uh, some of the great artists, and even portraits uh, of the day, he was familiar with them. So he was very much into the art. He didn't have that much interest in the property here itself, I think, I, most of that was left to his brother to run, even though he was the owner, I think, at the time. Or was that fairly accurate? Uh, he inherited the place. Yes. Uh, he did spend a lot of time. In fact, he went off to Paris to become an, an artist at first. Yes. He wasn't successful there. He, he was involved. He was a good friend of many, in fact. Yes. A great artist. But he, uh, he, he went back to London then. Right. And he tried his, his hand at being an author. Came back here on and off. He wouldn't yeah. have been here that quite often. Right. Any time he did come here, he caused a bit of a stir. Okay. Because either it would be, uh, he had a problem with the, the, the clarity, of course, as you yeah. were. Because we'll have to go back to um, George Henry was the person that subsidised and was built uh, basically the church. In, in Carnico. Yeah, that's right, and, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah. I, I don't think uh, yeah, he wasn't uh, a practising Catholic. No, he wasn't, means. no. But no. He, um, he he came back during, he, he wrote quite a lot of novels in England and then he wrote a lot of, about around this particular area. Yeah. He, came, he came back then to Dublin in 1901-ish, the early 1900s, and he got involved with um, Lady Gregory, who was one of the persons, yeah, and W. B. Yeats, and seeing Oscar Wilde, yeah, one, and uh, Oscar uh, Wilde's brother Willie as well. Oscar Wilde, well, he knew Oscar Wilde as a boy because he used to. They used to come. He'd go to visit them in Kong or that area, and he'd come over here to visit. Sure, uh, George, but uh, he uh, did a lot of writing at the time, but he uh, didn't just uh, think too much of. Uh, he didn't think too much of the Irish, oddly enough. It was funny, funny the way he was. He, he was really, 
Uh, he spent so much time in, in England. He spent so much that time in England. His, his mind was persuaded elsewhere. Yeah, he had this thing about uh, <laughs> the Irish. Said, Ireland wasn't a place for gentlemen to live in. Not a place for gentlemen <laughs> to live in. And he said about <laughs> what is it, James Joyce that he was only a beggar. As I say, we were talking about earlier about the, the house and, and the burning of the house, but it possibly was more agrarian than it was uh, Republican driven. Yeah, yeah. I think that that was a... There was a lot of dispute over who was getting the, land and who Usually wasn't. I dispute that, to be quite honest with you, because uh, I know um, the Mayo during the, the Civil War was predominantly... Um, Republican. Republican. And uh, this would be a huge... Republican enclave, this particular oh, yeah, area, right, Bally yeah, Glass, yeah. Carnacorn, yeah. back into Mayo Abbey, back into Bal. But they felt they weren't the getting area. any of the share. Well, it, it was it, the problem was the way the land was maybe being distributed. Some people felt that it was more of the Free State uh, people who were sympathising with the Free State. I think it yeah. was an easy scapegoat to blame the IRA to burn it down. Well, there was no one prosecuted for it anyway. There, there, there was no one prosecuted for it, and uh, I, I, I would say that, um, like the likes of, uh, you know, Michael Kilroy, who was the commander yeah, right. of the, uh, uh, of the IRA in, in, in Mayo at the time, he he, he, he wouldn't have, uh, no, have approved wouldn't, the no. likes of this. Well, or the likes of Tom McGuire wouldn't no. have approved it. Or PJ Rutledge or Ernie O'Malley or all yeah. these people that would maybe come here on and off. It would never, it, it was definitely yeah. an outside. It, it, if it was, it was a splinter group. Yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a splinter group that just decided mm. for some reason or another we we're, we're going yeah, to do this. Would, no, he, he wasn't uh, uh, buried in the family vault either. Because no, they had no. A, they have a place the, where... The vault is only the, opposite the, the entrance into the main, the main yeah, house there. But he, that's he, right. He's not buried there. He was uh, brought out and his ashes. Yes. And uh, he, it's, it's there, there's a little... Uh, monument built it to him there. Yeah, uh, correct, yeah. Uh, here we have a poem called Rondo by George Moore. Moore Hall, he, George lived from 1852 to 1933 and the poem is, was written in 1878. Did I love thee? I only did desire to hold thy body unto mine and smite it with strange fire of kisses burning like wine and catch thy odorous hair and twine it through my fingers amorously. Did I love thee? Did I love thee? I only did desire to hold thine eyelids lily-wise closed down, and thy warm breath respire as if through the thickening sighs, and speak my love in such fair guise of passion sobbing agony. Did I love thee? Did I love thee, I only did desire to drink the perfume of thy blood in vision, and thy senses tire seeing them shift from ebb to flow in consonant sweet interlude. And if love such a thing not be, I love not thee. Morris's brother then, he did, didn't inherit the place. He was a, a, a colonel in the uh, the oh, Connacht yeah, Rangers. He, he fought in the now, Boer he War. He fought in the Boer War, yes. and he fought also in the uh, the Zulu campaign, and other campaigns again. And he was highly decorated. Yes, but he disliked the situation down there in South Africa, the way the uh, the colour people were being treated. Yeah. So he was he, meant to be quite a bit humanitarian. He really. was. He was. He, he when he when he when he got up, when he left the army. Yes. He was in full support of um, the, the move, the cooperative movement, and Horace Plunkett. Yeah. Yeah. And he yeah. was in full support of uh, land distribution. Right. He was appointed then when, when the uh, the Free State came into being. He he was appointed as a senator. That's right, yeah, uh, correct. And he, he, he worked very well there. Morris did, worked wondrous a, a, as, a, as a senator and as a person. He was a yeah. huge humanitarian. Correct, correct, but, yeah. Uh, he was and he's man. kind of not uh, as well... 
no, mentioned as no, which is a, a, is other, a shame. You know. Yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah, it's a shame. But even uh, uh, George Augustus Moore, like you know, he was up there really with uh, the James Joyce's and all the rest of them in terms of what he was capable of writing and his literature and that. But he never got the same notoriety either. No. It was kind of written out of it. And that could popular. be a uh, Dublin thing too. He was more popular in, in London in English circles yeah. than he was here. Correct, yeah. He was anglicised to that degree that he yeah. he always thought that he was more of an <laughs> That's right, yeah, well it takes all kinds. All that remain are the must-covered walls But the light now is fading and the darkness is creeping. The leaves are whistling. I fear I must go. For the owl and the bat have awoke from their slumber. And I must make haste from the haunts of Moor Hall. Oh, I must make haste from the haunts of Moor Hall.